For me, I own what I don't know. You know, to this day, if there's something I don't know, I have no problem. I don't think it makes me any less than. I don't think that I lose value because I won't know something. It's just the truth. I don't know. But because I don't know, what my life has shown me is that when I stay in the place of I don't know, what I need to know will come. When we disrespect those places and we don't own that for ourselves, what you need to know is coming to you, but it's not going to be able to find you because it's looking for you in the place of I don't know. And so, you know, if you're somewhere perpetrating a fraud and pretending, that you know, then what you don't know that you need to know is not going to find you. Elliot Carlisle is a consultant for the CFDA, which is the Council of Fashion Designers of America. He's also an author, an empowerment speaker, a life coach, and a diversity and inclusion advocate. But this native Floridian with a robust music background made a major life pivot to pursue a career in the fashion industry. In the face of his pursuits, Elliot overcame severe sickness and homelessness only to ascend to new heights as one of fashion's leading voices. I was completely transformed and uplifted by his story, and I hope that you are too. Good morning. Oh my God, you look so chic. <laughs> what is this? Oh, no. yeah, yeah, is this yeah. Chappelle? From Rico. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Cute. Well. Oh my how God, how yourself? are you? Uh, so excited to see your face finally. You know, I've been hearing your voice on Clubhouse for God knows how long now. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Yes. Well, thank you so much oh. for, oh, let me see the ring game. I know you guys can't see this, but it's pretty freaking phenomenal. I just need a list of like every okay. brand that you have on each finger. Post interview. I definitely want the big bomb. Oh one, yeah. Yeah. The, I, the listen, hammer. that is so insane that, I mean, it's not, I really want, I thought they were going to get this to me, but she's <laughs> You're like, eh, oh, I no, love that eh, so no. much. And it's heavy <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's everything. Those girls yes, are amazing. They really are. Yes. I just want to tap on the right. on a table with it. Like, excuse <laughs> Have you me. Seen their furniture? Excuse me. And they do they do yeah, furniture as well. I mean, those girls are their minds are just beyond. They are truly, truly artists. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to have to revisit that and, and see, what, see what I can, uh, you know, scoop it. up from Where New York. <laughs> I'm actually based in really? Silver Spring, Maryland, but I work in DC. I know. Well, well, you know, well, I okay. no longer work in DC technically. So I live here, right, but I work right. remotely in New York. So okay, that makes sense. That back makes and sense. Forth, back wow. and forth. Yeah. Yeah, most people are like, you left? I'm like, yeah, That's I had it. kids That's and a whole you know, family. It's interesting like, because I think before, you know, things slowed down where you're just going, going, going. All you know about people most of the time is just what they do and you may know the area that they live in and then that's just it. But then you find out yeah. during the pandemic, social oh, media, they have a family and they have, you know, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a whole oh, thing. They're really not it's from a whole thing. They from there. I mean, just so many things you learned about people just from observing Instagram. Oh, what are you doing there? You know? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. They're like, wait, right. what? What? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Elliot, welcome to a fashion moment. I I am so excited to have you here. And I just you. love your story and and love where this journey has taken taken you. So I would love to start at the beginning, really. Like, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And like, where did well, you grow up? I actually started in um, music. So my background, I'll just, I'll always start there. Um, I grew up in uh, Crestview, Florida. It's a city in the Northwest Florida area uh, in the Panhandle. My parents are uh, retired military and that's where they, uh, yeah, I'm an I'm Air oh, Force wow. grad. And so um, both my parents actually wow. were in the Air Force, so I'm retired master sergeants. And then um, I explored a lot of things as a, as a child. Um, I was a very explorative uh, kid and my parents, um, it's interesting because I didn't really understand at the time, but I, I connect it now. But um, one thing that my parents used to say to me when I was a kid was that, we're, no, we're not your friends. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> well, it's not your fault. Uh, you know, we, yep. we have a job to do, and we are raising you to be able to go anywhere in this world and survive. You have to be able to get on a plane tomorrow and go to wow. Japan if you had to, and can't speak a lick of Japanese, but you know how to survive. Um, and so, uh, just the freedom, wow. the liberty that I had to explore um, when I was a kid, I, it really has shaped uh, me being who I am today. And so, you know, I tried all kinds of things. I tried sports, and I remember playing basketball mm. one season. I, it was city league. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm six. Wait, one. how tall are you? <laughs> uh, uh, well, excuse. That's another thing you don't know about folks when you're talking to yeah, them so online. It, Amazing. Six, so it just you know height height in the family. <laughs> but my, um, wow. But he wow. put me in city league basketball, and you know it it was really really embarrassing. Uh, I only made one shot the whole season, <laughs> and it was actually for the other team because I guess I never paid attention at practice. <laughs> And realize that at halftime they change goals. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> nah, really bad. Nah, so my nope, dad was nope. like, "Okay, well, we try sports. That's not gonna work." And so maybe music is your thing. Now I was really <laughs> into music as a kid because my parents wow. are really into music. As far as listening, I do have a lot of uh, musical people in my family, especially on my dad's side. But it was nothing that mm-hmm. you know was in the immediate home. Um, and it was just me. I'm an only child as well. And so yeah, <laughs> and so I um. I then, you know, he noticed that I had this this knack for for music, and so I started um, singing. And, mm-hmm. and when I was in school, I was. Let me find out. Okay, I'm gonna. You know what? I'm gonna oh, tap no. you for a solo one of these days, Elliot. I'm, just, yeah. I'm like me, 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 me. I'm well, like, come I, on in. Um, I did, you know, musical <laughs> theater and show choir, and I was in performing groups all of my all of my grade school life. Wow. And um, but it was in, I would think about fourth grade that my mom was like, "We need to dive deeper into this. We're going to put you on piano lessons," which I hated. I did not want. To. Me too. Uh, really, I never finished. I my parents were like, "Really? Oh my gosh! I didn't have a choice." Let me tell you how bad it was. <laughs> my piano teacher lived four houses down from us, and my mom drive me to make sure that uh, I would go because <laughs> she couldn't trust me to walk down there. <laughs> and she, oh my God. What was your piano was teacher's name? Okay. <laughs> We're sorry about that, Sue. <laughs> Mine was Leanne. I sorry, would, Leanne. I to her and, um, and so I, I did. I started playing and then, you know, by the time I got good, you know, it was a cool thing. Oh, you know, he could play piano. So no, I can't play yeah. Football or basketball, but I can play piano, so you can't do that. So it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, same. and I did that uh, all of my grade school, and then when, I, of course, when I graduated high school, it never was a thought of, uh, about what you were going to do or what would you do. It was music. I mean, that was. I mean, I, if you were to interview anyone who wow. I went to high school with, they probably tell you, "Oh, we we thought Elliot was going to go do American Idol and go into that because that was just what people knew me for, and it's what I wow. ate, slept, and breathed." And when I went to um, a full music scholarship to Northwest Florida State College. Um, and I wasn't in, accepted into their show choir program. Um, my major was vocal performance and mu- musical theater. And I did the show choir, the jazz band, the magical singers, the symphony choir. Um, you had to take dance. I did jazz, tap, modern ballet, um, everything. I mean, this was literally my, you did know, you it's sleep? really interesting. I think I slept <laughs> on campus a, a lot. But when you were in the performing arts, so back where I'm from, performing arts is treated like like uh sports so just as big as sports is and where i'm from high school sports is just as big as college or nba um but so is the music programs i mean they're Mm. they're very huge lots of investors uh in that program so you know you were treated with this preferential treatment as if you were an athlete because you also brought Mm -hmm. money to the school um yeah so you know how that works in academia so it was really it was really my thing and i you know i never had a idea beyond that i never considered anything else um and then my second year i kind of went through this little mm, i don't know i guess you could say a little depression or or this connection um the thing mm. that music used to do for me i didn't you know i just didn't continue and i was very involved in music in my church as well i started at directing the adult wow Oh, yeah, Girl, they no, don't, no. they're not gonna <laughs> let you go at the church uh-uh, 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 the uh-uh, no nope. at age 10. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh and my by age goodness. 18, I grew up in the AME church, the African Methodist Church. And by the age 18, yeah. um, I was the Episcopal Director of Music for the 11th Episcopal District, which is the entire state of Florida and the Bahamas. Yeah, so it, it, Amazing. Um, did, did you, did you, were you one of those, um, 
instructors oh, would make people go row by very, row if I a note was, was off. I, mean, I never threw anything at anybody, but I was quite <laughs> intense. Like, well, you have to remember, like I had, the, you know, the gospel music and and which you know what comes from within it. Yes. And I had the technical training as well. You know, I was classically trained. I had, you know, the, the theory wow. and all of that. So bridging all of that together. And it really, it made me quite an intense <laughs> director. But you were in that space and then something just disconnected. Were you in a way sort of like, God, what's happening? Like, were you in a panic spiritually? Honestly, like, how, to, to like, be what honest was that with you, to tell you what it felt like, it was a shutdown. It was just a complete disconnect, all of it. And, and I'm telling mm-hmm. you, I didn't really discover that it was happening until midterms of that year because I realized I was failing all of my mm-hmm. classes except the music. And the only reason I was wow. passing the music ones is because that's why you had to show up for them because we had performances we were traveling. So, you know, you couldn't afford to yeah. miss. But as far as, you know, uh, math and ing- whatever else I was taking, I just wasn't going. And um, at midterms, you know, when you're a scholarship student, you know, they stay on top of that. So the dean of mm-hmm. music had a had a mm-hmm. with me and he said, you know, you're Uh-oh. about to lose your scholarship. He said, but I've talked to all of your professors, you know, when you're when you're an athlete or a music student, they'll, they'll work with you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he said, yeah, we're going to make it work. Right, right. <laughs> Extra he credit. Said, they're willing to work with you, but you're going to have to do you know, X, Y, and Z in order to catch up by the end of the semester. And I, I mm-hmm. sat there for a moment and I said, okay, this is going to be a lot, but I can do this. But at the same time, I'm really no, and it was in that moment when I realized, but I'm not sure this is what I want to do. And I'm getting ready to have to put all wow. this work in and I'm not even sure this is the route that I want to take. Is it worth it? And I remember leaving that day and just sitting in my truck and I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do from here. I don't want to do this anymore. I ju- it just really set with me. I've lost my passion for performing. And so, you know, I still love music, but I just didn't see that as my life. And so I, I really was on this journey of now figuring out, well, what else have you ever thought about anything? Is there anything else that speaks to you? You know, and there were all these little things in my life. Um, for instance, one thing, when all, uh, all of the years when I was in grade school, I was voted best dressed boy. I was voted most popular, most friendliest, um, mm. you know, those things. And, I think in that moment, I just started looking at things. Well, what have people been saying about you? And what what are things that keep coming to you? And I've always, you know, liked, I guess I can say liked fashion. I, I wouldn't say I even knew about fashion. I just, you know, my parents dressed really well. They, they made sure I dressed really well. I did have a particular yeah. style and a look, you know, growing up that people appreciated. So there was something in that. And I, I think to an extent I may have been curious, but nothing that was ever, you know, a sure possibility for me in terms of reality. Uh, you know where I'm from. There's no yeah. fashion market. There's no doing any fashion. Nope. No. Nope. People shop. There's Didn't retail, know a but thing. beyond that, like you know, I'm not. I don't want to work at a <laughs> yep. store. Um, so. Yeah. yeah I'm like designers. That. My mom was like, yeah. you can't sell what you want to be a designer so for. <laughs> and so then I realized, you know, with New yeah. York that you could come and you could, uh, you know, just visit. So I just said, I want to visit. You know, I. You were, but you were on MySpace yes, on doing MySpace. something, right? And sort of uncovered, like, oh, well, Fashion for some Week. Reason, like, I connected with all of that? these people um, that were in fashion or connected to fashion, especially the ones in New York. And I saw that, you know, as Fashion Week started to approach, they started talking about it. So I was like, I want to come and check it out. You know, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I really didn't. And so I just came and I said, you know, I'm going to check this out and see, and see what's up. But I thought it was like a Broadway show. You know, I thought you come and you buy a ticket to where you you and and you go. (laughs) I saved up a little money. So I was like, okay, you know, if shows should cost around this much, I should should be able to get a ticket even if I'm in the back. I mean, honestly, Kirsten, I had no clue. And so when I came, of course, you realize, oh, this is not how it works. You can't get in. So I hung outside for, nope. you know, I don't know how how long. And then I decided I'm going to talk to some people. And so oh. I just started looking around to see who can I talk to. And you remember in the days of of, of the tents and even Lincoln, Lincoln, you can hang outside and yes. see people coming, coming in and out. And it was like, oh, well, maybe I should go talk to this one. I'm seeing people who I kind of know, but not not really. I knew nobody in the industry. So all the yeah. people, I mean, at that time, I don't even think I knew who Anna Winter wow. was. So I remember seeing her arrive, of course, and walk up with her entourage and all the cameras going crazy. I'm like, who is that? You know, so yeah. it was so funny. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time I saw Andre <laughs> Leon Talley walk in, just all the people. And I'm like, oh, he uh, looks for me. I think I've seen him somewhere. 
American Idol. Ooh, sorry. I mean, I mean, it. American Idol, America's Next Top Model. And I'm like, so you know, all these different things. Yeah. Um, but then I finally realized, okay, there's some people in black they looking for, it, and they're part of the staff in some way. So I went and talked to them. And, and I knew that because back home at the time while I was in oh. school, I was working with an event planning company. And so you know, we wore black for oh, our okay. events and that was a, a little bit of a sign yeah. for me. So I went and talked to this young woman. I can't remember her name now, but she worked with seven. Yeah, I was like, who was <laughs> the woman in she, black? Well, she who was she? House PR. I want to say her name was <laughs> Stephanie, if I remember correctly. But Oh my good. I seventh house that's mandy matt yeah, i'm like I, stephanie, stephanie i, I hope that uh, one day she sees me and says something and I re- i'm the one who talked yes. to you outside the tent but she um she did take the time to talk to me and you know i asked well how can you get in and she explained the process about you being you know you needing to be press or industry in order to come and um you know what fashion week is about and why it exists and you know so buyers can you know, see and press can see what's coming uh, for the next season. And I was like, okay, this makes sense. I mean, really basic, you know, one on fashion week, one on one. And then I said, well, how can I get inside? Yeah. And she said, well, you, the best thing for you to do would be to volunteer. So I'm like, oh, well, where can I sign up? And she said, well, no, you can't do it now. It's too late. You have to come back next season. And, you know, of course I was crushed. I'm like, I don't, I gotta wait a year. You should have just popped over yeah, at that trailer so with Patty and said hello. I now I'm like, oh, I could, I still could have done this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Patty right, would have right. been like, oh, come on so in. I came back um, <laughs> the next season. Interestingly, at that time, you could you could um, apply to volunteer online, and they would, if you were outside of New York, you could do a Skype interview. Um, so I did a Skype interview, and um, wow. I was accepted. I think Kate Kate Simpson Simpson was who I worked with at the time. Day. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yes. and Ray Young, wow. you know Ray. Yes. Um, she was there um, at the time, yes. and so uh, I came back, and and then Beat they had all. to fire a production captain that day um, when I was working on set. I don't remember. Wh- I think she was taking pictures, wow. something, but she violated the code of conduct. Yeah. yeah. And that they offered me right. the job, and they said, "Well, you know, <laughs> we're going to pay you, and we're going to we're going to train you." And um, I got to work with Elvis Cabrera, uh, who I still friends with today, wow. um, and I think he still does a lot of uh, production work at the tents. Um, but he he's the, he's the one who trained me. Him and Doug Shingleton, who I think is no longer um, with us, but they were the two guys that showed me the roots at the tents. And um, yeah. Lincoln Center was my start into the industry. <laughs> wow! 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 So you transitioned into I did, fashion I did. PR? So, of course, at, at that, that time, you get to see all the aspects of, of fashion and what it takes to put on a show, which most people only know about models and designers. And, you know, that. It. and I, I had, yeah. I mean, when you're working production, you know, you're working with seating, you're working with PR people, you're doing seating. And for me, you know, I was there as a sponge. I'm soaking up everything. I'm watching everything from the lighting people to the choreographer. I didn't know they had show choreographers. Yeah. I knew, I didn't know there were movement directors. I didn't know. I mean, it, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had no LDJ. clue that there were all of these things, you know, that go on to putting yeah. putting a show together. But man, when PR people would come in, the way they would move and what they would do, I was like, this is me. Like, this is the thing that I that I really am good at. I thrive in this area. Um, you know, when I was looking at the way that I would work at, with the event planning company back home, I'm like, this is what we do. We just didn't have a PR department. So whatever event you worked on, yeah. you did the PR, the marketing, the 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 everything, the planning itself. And so I said... I want to do this. And so I just started researching and looking into PR. I would ask some questions, you know, with the publicists I got to work with or the, the account executives I got to work with while I was uh, at, on set at the tents. And they were like, you know, you can do this. You just need to know this. You need to know that. You need to read this. You need to read that. And I just taught myself, um, you know, and added it to the things that I was already wow. able to do. I, I, I believe that. this, Chris. You know, the things that you're called to do, uh, it comes from within. And so I don't believe that all the time you have to have all of this education or training because there's just something natural that you're born with and you're just able to do it. And I do believe that I just had a natural ability, a gifting um, to do PR and to move in that way and to work with people. I'm very much a people person. So it was being on on hand on set on out front that's that yes. works for me very well but also i love the behind the scenes aspect of it as well i didn't really see myself you know i had come from the performing art world so i'm used to being stage i'm used to being on the mic i'm used to the lights the cameras the action yeah. this is a whole different you know flow for me being behind the scenes and i loved it i really really liked it um i love being a part of the magic that moves what you see on on scene I um I then just decided to yeah. rebrand my MySpace page and I do that with air quotes. I had no clue 
I had no clue what branding was. I don't even know if I ever <laughs> I used that. the term at that point. <laughs> but I I said I redesigned my MySpace page to reflect that I did fashion PR and events and started a company yes. with a business partner who I met virtually, who I didn't meet till eight years later in person. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> we did. <laughs> Podcasts are awesome, and I know you love them too, or you wouldn't be here right now. But have you ever thought about starting your own? Don't worry, you don't have to be a techie, but you do need a bit of guidance so you don't make costly mistakes. My name is Sunny, and I've been podcasting for a long time. I've launched more than 15 profitable podcasts, and I'm the founder of the Independent Podcast Network. My online course, How to Launch Your Profitable Podcast in 30 Days, gives you the keys to the five P's of podcasting, which is everything you need to launch and grow a successful podcast. You get unlimited access to more than 35 videos and dozens of handouts. And when you purchase my course, you're also supporting this awesome podcast because they're getting 50% of the money when you use their special link. How cool is that? Let me help you get started with your podcast. Go to podcastsareawesome.com slash fashion. That's podcastsareawesome.com slash fashion. I am just, first of all, let me, let me just pause for a second. I think it's phenomenal that you were not afraid to ask questions. Like, I feel like sometimes people are like, oh my God, should I ask? And, you know, I'm sure you got some like, you know, no's along the way, but you just consistently kept asking and getting the information. Well, you know, for me, I own what I don't know. You know, to this day, if there's something I don't know, I have no problem. I don't think it, it makes me any less than. I don't think that I'm, I, I lose value because I don't know something. It's just the truth. I don't know. But because I don't know, what my life has shown me is that when I stay in the place of I don't know, what I need to know will come. I think many times we don't want. Uh, well, I felt that myself. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> but I believe that. Yeah, many <laughs> times when we, when we disrespect those places and we don't own that for ourselves, what you need to know is coming to you, but it's not going to be able to find you because it's looking for you in the place of I don't know. And yeah. so, uh, you know, if you're somewhere, you know, perpetrating a fraud and pretending that you yeah. know, then what you don't know that you need to know is not going to find you. Ah, oh, I love that. I love that. So you start a PR I did I mean, with your with the, with the friend that you met on MySpace, and well, how like how did you structure that? Like who like what types of companies were you representing? Like I know there's like beauty accessories, fashion. Like, well, interestingly, we worked with fashion and entertainment um, wow. company artists and brands. Now, how this happened was I had a client, um, I worked in the pageant world. I had a client who was a pageant, a Miss Corporate America pageant. And my assistant um, during the pageant, when I would go to Orlando uh, to do it, they would assign an assistant to me. And I had an assistant named Kunta Braswell, who was also an aspiring model. And Kunta had just come back from Atlanta um, working with this photographer named KJ Anderson, who did uh, his photo shoot. And so we were literally uh, backstage at the show. And um, he was talking to me about what I do. And he was like, you know, you're really good and you should expand this because at that time I had no website. I had, I mean, I, it was just, you had to come to my page and know who I was as an individual. And he said, you, you really need to take this to the next level. But I had a lot of fears. I said, well, I don't know design. I don't know how to do a website. I don't know where to start. I don't know this. I don't know that. I'm telling him all the things that I don't know. And he said, but you have X, Y, and Z and you can do this and you can do ABC. And I said, yeah, but I, if I had all of this, it would be good. And he said, well, I actually just finished doing the photo shoot with a guy in Atlanta who, who, has all the stuff that you don't have. Y'all should come together. He literally connected us on MySpace. We had a call and within two weeks, we had started the business. Like I just, oh I just felt him. It just made sense. And so we started a company called Visual Renaissance Experience 7 LLC, which was I love it. <laughs> and, and we worked with fashion and entertainment. He was already doing a lot of entertainment. So we worked with, you know, gospel artists. We had done, um, we, we worked with the Clark sisters. We did. Yes. Uh, Do you know years. Carlton Spence, by the way? Carlton Spence. That name is very yeah, familiar. He styles a lot of the gospel artists. I was just wondering okay. if you Yeah, if I was going to say his name is very yeah. familiar. I'm sure we've come acro across one another. Yeah, of course. Um, 
Yeah, but I, I did that, and um, and we worked with uh, fashion people, and, and I was meeting people just at the tents who would say, oh, well, how'd you get into this? I mean, even volunteer staff, one of the one of the blessings today, even with um, the project I'm working on now with CFDA, I've run into contact with so many people who were volunteers of mine at the tents who are now doing things. I mean, a couple years ago, I went to a, a brunch that Sasha and Bobby had, and their in-house PR director, um, his name is Edwin Exhouse, I'm not sure if you know Edwin, but I'm there and, and he's another black man. And I was introducing myself, excited to see a black man here in this position. And I'm introducing myself and he's listening to me. And I'm like, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. And he's just looking at me with this <laughs> interesting smile on his face. And he said, Elliot, I've known you for years. And oh I said, my goodness. Well, where did we meet? He said, I met you at the tents. I was one of your volunteers when you were the production ca uh, captain at, at Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. And wow. you talked to us about this and you talked to us about that. And I, I'm still the woman who's now running the Dayton, Ohio Fashion Week and Dayton, Ohio um, Emerging in Fashion Incubator. She was one of my volunteers as well. And she was like, Elliot, I started all of this because of you. Um, you know, so these things that you run back into, it, they just, I, I mean, I can't even tell you. They're very uh. humbling, but they're very fulfilling and rewarding because I don't, I don't remember any of these people until I, I re-meet them and they introduce. But one thing that I have always been is try to be intentional about yeah. opening a door, um, providing access, providing information in any way that I can. Um, it, I just believe in paying it forward. Absolutely. And you, you decide at one point to go back and get your degree and finish yes, yes. I, I, you know i didn't your even undergrad degree. a couple of years ago that i i started my career and i've navigated half of my career as a as a college dropout i really didn't realize mm -hmm. that yes in 2012 i decided you know i do want to go back and get that piece of paper and at that time i had done a lot i really had at yeah this point. I had produced my own shows for Fashion Week. I was working with regional Fashion Weeks. Um, I'd had Northern Virginia Fashion Week as a client, Atlanta yeah. International Fashion Week as a client. I'd worked with Tampa Bay Fashion Week. I mean, I had I was really proud of the things that I had done, and most of them virtually, Kirsten. So wow. like this this new environment and everybody's doing things from Zoom. This is honestly the way that I worked my entire career because most people think I've been in New York all my life. I wasn't. I, I still was in Florida and then I moved to Charleston, South Carolina in wow. 2012 to um, get my degree from the Art Institute of Charleston. And Amazing. so I did that only to work you know, they're just, I mean, really as a student, I just said, I'm going to work and I'm going to be here as a student. I had no connections at that time. I had no clue that Charleston even had a fashion week. And when somebody mentioned it, I laughed. Um, and then <laughs> I actually went the first time, my mind was blown. I said, like, yeah. this is Bryant Park. This is Bryant Park in the South. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And of course I ended up, start, I've started as a volunteer with Charleston Fashion Week. My wow. Actually my first thing that they started me to do. Now, mind you, I'm working with New York. I have all these clients. I have this whole brand. I have this business. And I, I applied as a volunteer for Charleston wow. Fashion Week. And you know what I did? My first my mm. first day working, they stuck me on trash duty. Hey, you know and what? I out the trash. That, no yeah. matter how high yeah. up you get, yep. if you're in PR, <laughs> like, it, it, you got to pick up the trash. Yeah. And people talk about it. that. And I'm like, but you will never stop taking out the trash. I take out the trash never. in my own house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I take, I, yeah. And as a former event director, somebody taking out the trash is very somebody. important. If nobody <laughs> takes out the trash, it, gets, it can get really messy. And also, it was an easy job. I stand around until I see the trash. Oh, board. the people just, watching, too. It's like yeah, you're I grabbing and watching. <laughs> Absolutely. I got to talk, and I did it, and I did it with pride. I was happy to do it. But also, for me, it was another backstage opportunity. So I got wow. to see how Ch Charleston Fashion Week runs, who's the who's who. I got to ask a lot of questions. But then the next season, I was now a part of the leadership team and working with the volunteers. And then they ended up assigning me wow. to work with Fern Malice as her uh, yeah. assistant for the week um, when she was coming. Oh, so that's she, how you met. And that's how officially. we connected. We had met or, previously at yeah. in the course, but she didn't remember who I was. But yeah, that's the we, personal time. Mm -hmm. wow. That's where we connected. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what what was it like uh, working with Fern? Like, what are some of the key lessons that you learned from Fern Malice mm -hmm. while working with her? Because she's um, such a such an icon in the industry and has, yeah, you know, is essentially the founder of New York Fashion Week. Like, what are what are some of the lessons that you learned, whether they're professional or personal, about yourself? Well, I will say first, 
this is key because there were a lot of people. I think I was very surprised to be offered the opportunity. Um, there seemed to be um, some fear around it. I think there were some other people that were asked before me, but I mm-hmm. think people were afraid. And I, I, if I, if I go back and do the timing, because I don't remember when the movie came out, but I think the Devil Wears Prada movie had kind oh, of, no. <laughs> movie had kind of scared people from from fashion people from New York. Um, yeah. You know, in the South and in these other markets, people really do reference fashion by yeah. what they have access to. And yeah. these are things that people have access to when you're outside of New York. So, of course, you know, New York people have a different mentality. Because I had worked in New York, um, I, w- I was like, oh, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. I'm fine. But a lot of people were afraid. I mean, it just, you know, I think they thought, you know, she may have been this bulldog or she was this, this mm. diva. And so the, the first thing that I, for me, that I had to remind people that I had to remember is people, these are people. You know what I'm saying? They may have big personas. They have yep. big Im- They made Im- big impact. They have big legacies. But their people, you know, outside of that. And so, uh, you know, for me, just connecting with her as a person and learning who she was as a person, I think one of the, um, the first, I think I would say power points we had or moments we had was realizing uh, we were riding in a car and I remember all week long, they had been talking about her birthday and they kept referencing, you know, her birthday and, and Charleston would also get a cake for her every, um, every fashion week. And, you know, cause she would always come down around her birthday. And so I just happened to ask the question, well, people keep saying happy birthday and your birthday is coming up. Well, when is your birthday? And she said, it's March 26. And I said, you're lying. And she said, well, Ellie, why would I lie about that? I said, <laughs> That's crazy. And she said, why? So I pulled out my driver's license. And I gave her mine and she saw my birthday is March 26th as well. So we realized what, we your had- birthday <laughs> twins. Mm-hmm. Wait, Aries, right? Aries. Aries. I yep. love Give it to him straight. No chaser. I yes, love yes, Aries yes, people. It makes yes. Sense. Yes. So wow. I would say that's one of the things that I, I will say I learned about Fern, but also appreciate about Fern. She is very big on straight. No chaser. Direct yep. Yep. Chaser. Yep, and we we just interviewed her on the show. She okay, is a okay. straight shooter. <laughs> yeah, she's very, she's a I love shooter. it. Yeah, one hundred all the way. Um, and you know, for me, it just reminded me of home. Um, mm, because wow. that's the way that my parents are. That's the way we still deal to that. Most people when they hear me and my parents talk, they're like, "What? Like y- y'all talk like that?" <laughs> but we're just very direct people. My you know, my yeah. parents are retired Air Force, so they're very much. Oh, yeah. They were both you know, uh, um, they were officers. So they're, they're quite militant in the way that they deal, but, um, Fern is not militant, but she is. very, And, um, I think that, you know, for me, I was prepared for that. I have this thing that I believe that every moment you've ever been through in your life, everything that you've been through in your life prepares you for the moment of now. Wow. And so um, I realized that, you know, working with her, I was just able to borrow from so many things that I've done. I wasn't her publicist, but for the week I was able to apply my PR skills. Um, I know what it's like, you know, being on set with her at interviews, you know, I was able to apply some cr- cr- creative direction things, you know, she would ask, yeah. and she really pulled on all of these things for me, you know, she asked things about, you know, how she should, excuse me, how she should dress or, you know, yeah. shopping with Fern. That was another thing when she comes to, when she goes to regional fashion week, she shops the cities and she shop, we would walk every store on King Street. I mean, we would go in and she would shop. You were on King Street? I love it. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And so that's, that's, you know, those were things that I, I really had fun doing. I think we got to know each other on a, on a personal level. So I finished school in 2015 and I thought that I was going to just go back into PR. Mm. Um, but that didn't really happen for me. Honestly, I thought that once I got this piece of paper, I actually thought I would be able to now start applying for like to work with a big firm. Right. But I applied for a job in this industry and even gotten a call for an interview to this day. Wow. Um, I've never been responded to from uh, from an email about a job. Never. Wow. An wow. email or or an application. Um, mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so it's, never- it's in a, you know, this is something I think that comes up with a lot of industries like this. And, mm-hmm. and I remember this episode of uh, Black AF, which I love. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where <laughs> Tyler Perry is essentially talking about, um, you know, in Hollywood, how all these actors and actresses are begging for a seat at the table, mm-hmm. like the Oscars mm-hmm. and all these mm-hmm. awards. But essentially, instead of doing that, literally building your own table. Um, mm-hmm. Is that what you did, Elliot? 
you know, I, I would say it now and, and I say it very humbly because I wasn't intentionally doing it. Honestly, I was just trying to survive, uh, you know, even even having this website and this brand. And I, I didn't have all of this from the beginning. All of this is new. This this all came about in 2012 wow. um, once I moved to Charleston. And I realized I needed to do something in order to make money because I, I had to work. Um, nobody was hiring me where I was applying. Um, and so I said, well, I've got to build this business for myself. And so really it was just about putting myself out there professionally so that people understood that, you know, I am a business and not just, you know, a volunteer or personal service. And I had to do that because honestly, I, I, I always want to help. I volunteer all the time. I do so much, you know, for free more. And I get critiqued a lot. I get criticized a lot for it. I mean, some Uh, of my, some people that will listen to this will probably get really (laughs) upset because they, I mean, people get on me about that all the time, but it's just the way that I've always had a heart to help. And most of how I've navigated the industry has just been getting opportunities because there was a, there was a need for help. Mm -hmm. Um, but then having to realize, but I do have to be paid. I have to eat. I have bills, you know, I have to take care of myself. So literally that's the reason I started, you know, doing that. And it was because my friends and actually KJ, uh, my business partner, you know, by the time I moved to Charleston, we had, we had split ways and divided Mm -hmm. us off the company because he moved to LA to now get in film. So he's in LA. Oh, Oh, these LA folks. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but he but he really talked and he said, Elliot, you really need to do this for yourself. He said, it's going to help you go to the next level if you can properly bring yourself. You're already doing the work. So it's not that you need any of that. You just need to fix the presentation. And so mm. I took his advice and I, I did that. But honestly, I wasn't thinking about a table or anything. It was just, you know, I, I want to look professional. That, that was my yeah. only thought. I want to yeah. look professional. And, um, you know, I'm very glad that I did. And, you know, it has been beneficial and rewarding for me, but I just didn't, I didn't think of it that way. And honestly, honestly, I will be very transparent with you and said, sometimes I've looked at it as a blessing and a curse because even still after doing that, you know, for me, it was a means of survival. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted to work with other people and it, it was a, I believe it's been a bit of a barrier for me. I believe that it's been, you know, some people have looked at it as a catch 22, you know, well, you have this brand. Well, why do you want to work with, with me? Um, yeah. Even when I, yeah. when I moved to New York in 2017, you know, Fern um, had actually reached out and asked me to help her find another assistant. Um, and she was having trouble doing that. And I just felt at this time, it's kind of a, a moment for me to do the next thing. And so I said, well, well, what do you need? And so, you know, we started going through it and I said, well, you know, I'll come and do it. And so wow. I came, um, but even that, you know, I had to speak with an HR person. Uh, she had, she had the person do the interview with me. Mm-hmm. And the woman said to me, uh, well, I don't think Fern should hire you. I told her not to hire you. I'm doing this conversation because she asked me three times to talk to you. She said, mm-hmm. but I told her not even to hire you. And I said, well, why? And she said, you know, because I checked out your Instagram. I checked out your website. You have this brand. You've done all this work. You work with all these people. I mean, you, you have a whole career trajectory that's, you know, set to do your own thing. Why do you want to work with other people? And I said, well, if you look at my website, it says building people for, at that time, it said building people for global influence. Now it says mm. helping people to turn up the volume in their life and business. And I said, but either way, I'm about building people so I can be fluid in however I work. Absolutely. I said, and the thing is based off of my conversation with Fern, there's things that, that I can help her do. There's yeah. solutions I can provide. And so, and after she and I had a conversation, then, uh, oh, she yep. was, she's like, I want it. I yes. want him. <laughs> so she was like, yeah. um, and I said, well, thank you for allowing, you know, me to have the opportunity to talk to you. And I, and I believe that that's one thing that I've always said. If I, if people just talk to me, I think that they would yep. understand, um, a little better about who I am. I'm not necessarily always sure about how to present that because I'm not really you know, I believe that we give best what we need most and people see the things that I do with other people as far as branding and yeah. marketing and PR. And I'm really good with other people well, with myself. I'm really not. I really have a lot of insecurities. Well, I don't know. This brand and I'm, I'm seeing on your website looks pretty good to me. <laughs> well, thank you. I, was like, uh, but I, will, I will be honest with you. I have no I have no involvement in that whatsoever. <laughs> This, I literally, uh, you know, Michael Weston is is the gentleman who does my website and um, that, and he 
that he does it based off of what he sees with me. I've it's never beautiful in any direction or anything like that. And honestly, the people, even the photo shoots that I've done, all of that, I think people may think that I'm sitting around. I know a lot of people who have these personal brands. They're they're yeah. coming up with this content and they're doing content creation is not my thing. Um, I've just been blessed that people see something with me and they'll reach out and say, can I do this with you? And that's how all of those things have happened from the magazine placements. I mean, even you doing the interviews, I don't pitch myself for interviews. I don't, I mean, I really don't spend time pitching or promoting myself like people think that I do. I'm a yeah. published author. One of my friends always asked me, you never talk about your book. You never promote I know. Your- I, I was <laughs> looking at, I was like, wait, like, <laughs> you I feel never like I need that. this. It's so just, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I just don't, I, I don't know. I, I just What's don't the name of your book, by the way, Elliot? It's called The Influence Workbook. <laughs> I see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon. It's on Amazon. It, it, you get the, you know, I'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. It's just not my thing. I'd rather yeah. talk about other people and promote other people. I mean, I like, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it comes out of me easier. Doing it for myself, yeah. I just feel... I, I don't know. Maybe it's something I need to work on. I'm going to sit with myself, but I, I really do. I'm there with you. You know, my team is like, Kirsten, more photo shoots, more content, content, content. And I've just never been that type of gal like mm-hmm. for myself. So it yeah. took a lot for me to start doing like photo shoots and yeah. like yeah. promotion, like for me, like myself, yeah. but really this platform in my mind and what the purpose really was to uplift the stories of other folks in the industry and to show that fashion is number one relative, but also there are actual human beings. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are people behind this and it's not all devil worse Prada. You know, there's people from all over the country and the world who just have a love for this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, one of the other thing is a lot of what I do is so personal, you know, mm. there's things that I never, I can't really post on Instagram either. I mean, there are things yeah. that the way that people use me, even as far as my, the coaching that I do, like, I can't mm-hmm. talk about that. That's all very private and confidential, but you know, there's just things that I'm involved in, in people's lives and even in their businesses in ways that it, it just, it, I feel like I would look real strange and different to promote that or post it. So I just yeah. don't, um, you know, well, I, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rewind it back for a minute because you've been through some things like things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at one point you were like, you know, sleeping on air mattresses. You also went back home and got sick. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, um, it's interesting. Yeah. When I, um, and this is actually before um, I moved to Charleston, though. I, it was while I was home. I, I did wow. a speaking engagement and I got food poisoning um, really, really, really bad. And um, I don't know. It, it had some reactions. I was having issues with medication. And, you know, I went into hospital just two days of food poisoning. What do you think is supposed to pass in a day? You know, but I'm not able to keep anything down. I'm throwing up. I'm, I'm doing all that. All that most people do when they have food poisoning, but yeah. for some people, it just wouldn't leave me. And so I go into the hospital and what, what was supposed to be an overnight stay for observation ended up being a, a month and a half stay oh. um, where my body system started shutting down. My kidneys were no longer functioning. Um, I lost weight. I got all the way down to 75 pounds. Oh my goodness, Elliot. I could not walk anymore. And literally what was going on with me, the doctor said that if you don't start improving, you're only looking at two weeks to live. Um, and I'm happy to say that was 12 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I'm still here. Um, um, God is good. But I was literally facing my death's door. Um, and I I made it back from that. Um, wow. So I, you Were you know, drinking green juice? No, no. I don't <laughs> I was on a lot of prayer. <laughs> prayer. I'm telling you, as, yeah. as I'm in a faith, I'm telling you, I. I am not not so much religious anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Not like I, I when I grew up, but I am definitely um, a believer in God in a way that I really can't explain to people. But I yeah. just know, you know, there's all kind of arguments about spirituality and whatever. But what I know to be true in my life because of what I've survived, um, I can never deny it. You know, I can yeah. deny. I can argue all kinds of things, but what I can't argue is an experience and what I know by experience this is real, you know, wow. um, wow. I, 
And it's literally what kept me. And it's and it's the same thing. That faith has kept me even through, you know, surviving surviving New York, I will say. Huh. You know, huh. How about that? <laughs> and, and that should be a show. Surviving okay. Oh my God. You know, just, when I moved to New York, you know, when I when I accepted this opportunity with Fern, she I had six days to move here to start. Wow. So you know, that's no time to plan to move. And it was it was spur of the moment. So, you know, my partner and I, we fit what we could fit into suitcases and we moved to New York. I was blessed to have friends that I could stay with, um, you know, and (laughs) it's so interesting, Uh, but I stayed on an air mattress uh, with them uh, for about a year and a half. Wow. And, um, you know, someone told me about this housing program, you know, and and people say, but you were working, you were doing all this, but it's, it Mm -hmm. just doesn't happen like that. And I, I struggled, Kirsten. I really, really struggled. And it was such a mental strain because, you know, business wise, I I was so successful. I was working and doing things and, you know, you're getting all these praise from people. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're doing this and you're doing that. And and it's like, but I'm, I still don't have my own, you know, and according to the the city of New York, I'm I'm homeless. Like I'm someone told me about this housing program and I was like, Oh, I can, I can check this out. And so I did. And then I found out in order to like enter this housing program that New York has, you have to actually check in and live in a shelter. You have to be a part of the Oh home. my goodness. Yep. And so I lived in a shelter for <gasps> eight months. Um, that was, that was very, very taxing. Um, and, and in a shelter with, you know, heroin addicts yeah. and mental patients. And, um, I mean, it was dark. It was really, wow. really dark for me. Um, but I kept going and I, and people asked me, how did you keep going? And especially when you come from, you know, I just, it was the lowest place I've ever lived in, in my life. I mean, I'm yeah. just like, place of life I was in. I'm not even dealing with the, the accommodations and the space itself. I'm talking about mm-hmm. the place I was in. It was such a low place, but I didn't die out there because I knew there has to be another side of this. Wow. This is not my destination. This is a temporary location and I am passing through. This is an experience, but it is not my existence. And that's the only thing I kept telling myself. And that's what enabled me to get out of that situation. Um, I mean, I've done the thing that most people here who are listening to this, they've probably done. I've rented rooms from people. Um, I mean, it's I've I've lived in the projects renting a room from from a woman who was bipolar and then put me out in the middle of the night. Like I can't. I mean, I've had I've had all kinds of experience. You know, just trying to get on my feet personally. You know, professionally, I was doing what I was doing, but personally, it was a struggle just to find my footing. But I will say that you just have to know for yourself. um, You just have to know that what you have been called to that everything that you need to sustain in it, it will show up. And that's the only thing that I knew. I knew that I was not, I didn't come to New York, although Fern, the job with Fern was my invitation. There was something bigger, even beyond that. And I believe that, you know, God used that to get me here, but there was more on the other side of that. And so I couldn't let it be what ended me. I couldn't have wow. a break. Then. I couldn't, I couldn't have, you know, one of those, one of those times where you just give up, even though there were many days where I really was brought to the edge to say, this is it. Because the thing with me is I had something to go back home to. I can yeah. easily go back home. You know what I'm saying? I could have went back to Charleston. I have a home there. I have, you know, I have friends, I have family. I could have been okay, you know, but I knew that, no, I have to endure this because there's something on the other side that's greater than this. And so um, even the way that I'm used now and the way that I'm able to help and encourage people and, and, and to let people know you can make it, you know, cause this industry is not kind to its people, um, unfortunately, yeah. but you know, if you can just sustain, you, you can live your dream and you can do what you know you were called to do. And so I just want to help people be able to sustain, you know, cause I've, <laughs> I've seen New York eat people up and and spit them out, you know, and it's not yeah. for everybody, but, but there is, there is something on the inside of you that will carry you. And so, um, I'm, that's why I'm sitting here talking to you today. Uh, yeah. Elliot, <laughs> Elliot. Oh my God. What a word. What a word, you know? So uh, first of all, eight months, eight months. Did you say eight months, eight months? Eight months. And I'm going to tell you something so powerful. Let me tell you how I left. Huh. I actually stood out. <laughs> huh. 
see, that's another thing. See, where you when you're places you're not supposed to be, you will often be driven out. And you can't be messed up by that. See, sometimes when we're put out of things, we get offended, we get uh-huh, upset. Yeah. But no, I was put out because I wasn't supposed to be here. The woman who runs the faci- that particular facility said to me, we're going to terminate um, terminate your, I guess you have like a lease or whatever, mm-hmm. but she was, we're going to terminate your, I wasn't paying, but she was like, we're going to terminate your lease because you don't need our services. This is what she said. You're not supposed to be here. Wow. <laughs> Wow. And she said that because she asked me a question. She said, where do you get up and go every day? She said, and I said, I told you I'm working. She said, well, where do you work? She said, I look at the way you're dressed because they've been watching. She was like, mm-hmm. we watch you come in and out of here. And we're like, well, what does he do? And so I started telling her what I do. And she said, well, if you're working, why are you here? I said, well, I mean, the truth, you want the raw truth? I'm, I just don't make enough money to get my own place yet. And yeah. she said, but you can do it. She said, honey, you can do it. She said, this, this, what we're doing here is for people that can't even get to where you are now. She said, wow. this, you can't, you can't live here anymore. She said, we, we got to let you go. And in that moment, of course I had a moment of, Oh, what am I going to do? God? Yeah. Like, what am I going to do? But then I said to myself, you know what? She just gave me something. She wow. said, you're not supposed to be here. So from that moment, it was, okay, where am I supposed to be? And, and based on what I'm, where I'm supposed to be, what is it that I need to get to where I'm supposed to be? And I've got to now do what I need to do for me. And that's how I feel out of that situation. Elliot, let me find out you're, you're, you're walking up in the, the shelter with your Balmain and like a Balenciaga, and, you know, your leathers, <laughs> your leathers, you know, your rag and bone, like it, it was looking at that. you like. It was none of that. <laughs> it, but it, I think it was just the way that I show up, you know, mm-hmm. it wasn't because you don't have to look like where you come from and you don't have to look like what you've been through. Mm. And I think that's the thing. I just don't look like what I've been through. Even what I was going through in that current moment, you wouldn't have known it if I didn't tell you. Wow. Wow. Well, how in the world did you end up at the CFDA as a consultant? So, you know, then the pandemic happens. And so, um, wow. Like, I mean, that that's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the pandemic, I... Um, at this point, I had been in a place where I knew that as far as my working relationship with Fern, I kind of was at the end of that. And and she knew I had been expressing some things. Um, you know, I just I was tired in some areas. Uh, I, I had just figured out there were some other things that I wanted yeah. to do that I really see that position, you know, evolving me into. And so um, I had been sitting with that for a while. And then the pandemic happens. And, you know, you're in this space where everything is shut down, everything is canceled. You're sitting at home. And in this time, of course, I was being pulled on a lot as a coach. And so I'm talking to people with, you know, pivot was the the buzzword of the mm, year. You know, everybody, yep. you know, how do I do that? And so, I mean, I'm on Zoom hundreds of hours a week talking to people about pivot strategy, all of that, because I, I realized in my life, I've really navigated making, making pivots, you yes. know? Um, and so, helping people do that, but helping them, you know, tie it to a business model. And so that it makes sense for them, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, I believe that you go from into, you know, you just don't yeah. let yourself go, go from, and you don't know what's next, but then also it's okay if you don't know what's next, but then the place of, I don't know is where you have to be okay sitting going back to where we started. So I, I did tell her and I said, you know, I, I think this is, this is it, this is the moment for me. And so July 1st, I decided to quit. Um, and I, I wanted to spend some time with me just to reconnect with some things. There were a lot of ways, you know, the experience, the homeless experience. I mean, there were just a lot of things that had affected me that I didn't realize I'd been affected by. And so I needed to regather gather myself. I needed to recalibrate. I needed to, health was the focus and I needed to make sure that I was healthy. Mm-hmm. And so I took time to do that. And then um, I said, okay, well, what are you going to do next, Ellie? You got to make money. I didn't know what I was going to do. Wow. I had no clue, no plan, whatever. So I said, I'm just going to be available for wherever there's a need. This is what I've always done. I'll just make myself available. Of course, the Black Lives Matter movement was happening. And so, you know, me being a black man, I became this voice that people needed to, hey, can you talk to my team about, you know, the black experience? Can you talk to my (laughs) team about this? Can you talk to us about diversity? Can you talk? So those things just happened. And then, you know, people were paying me for those things. And so, you know, I wasn't formally putting myself out there as a DNI professional, although with mm-hmm. Jewelry Week, I've been working um, with them and leading their uh, diversity and inclusion program called Here We Are that I launched in 2019. But 
other than that, I hadn't really been doing anything in that space other than just working while black. And yeah, so yeah. people were asking me about that experience. And I was blessed to have some really, really awesome conversations and engagements. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I tell people all the time, I've really been blessed to be connected to, with some genuine allies in this industry yeah. who did, want, you know, genuine help. And so I was doing that. And then um, I believe it was in a conversation with Jeffrey Banks um, one day. I, I was talking with Jeffrey. I don't even remember what we were talking about or why he called. And for those who are listening who don't know who Jeffrey Banks is, he's a CFDA member. He's actually on the Emeritus Board of the CFDA. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a Black designer. And um, he mentioned to me about the statement that the CFDA board had put out about uh, on June 4th in response to uh, the George, the murder of George Floyd. And I said, um, yeah, I said, you know, I did see that. And I said, it'd be interesting because I'm very curious on how they're going to execute that. Yeah. And he said, well, maybe I should talk to Stephen Cove about it. And so um, he did. And um, I told him that I had some ideas. And so I sent an email to him and told him about the ideas that I had. And he sent that over um, to Stephen. And Stephen was like, well, you know, Elliot, you know, we should have a call. And so we were just having a genuine call, you know, about that, just discussing some things as far as everything that was going on at the time. Of course, at that time, they were already in consideration for um, the woman that they ended up hiring to to lead particular initiative but he did say but you have connections with regional fashion weeks and i was like well yeah over the course of my career i worked with a number and we started talking about that and so he asked me to come on and work on a program um, to support regional fashion weeks which is now the cfda connects program that was launched in this year and i lead that program as a consultant oh my and and cfda for those folks who don't know what it is what is it <laughs> um, <fashion> designers <laughs> <of> America. <laughs> yes yes so the connects program is essentially doing what so it is it exists to support regional fashion weeks and the organizations and or organizations that produce them um, by uh, amplifying their vision their mission um, extending professional development resources from the CFDA to them but in an effort to help them increase their awareness oh, and I love that and their pulse to the Post of business, fashion, and trade in the American fashion industry. Oh, I love it. I love it. So this whole diversity and inclusion thing in the industry. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this is going to be something that is sustainable? Honestly, yeah. Um, or is right this a moment? I- yeah, you know? I feel that it's so trendy. Um, and I feel that a lot of the things that people have done, the initiatives, the movements, the programs that people have done were were uh, reactionary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I can say that just on the strength of the quickness that many of them uh, yeah. were on um, without any strategy, without any mm. education, without any real in-depth conversation, without looking really intensely intentionally and intensely at yeah. some of your policies and procedures and your structure uh, that's in place and i believe that um, because of that what we're seeing is the result of what was trendy um and if we really pay attention to a lot of what we're seeing many people are going back to what's comfortable mm. for them um, mm-hmm. because really in order to do this work kirsten i don't have to tell you this but in order to do this work you have to become comfortable being uncomfortable you have yeah. to I'm comfortable having uncomfortable conversations and you have to be willing to do this from an authentic place. And I just don't know if that, if the authenticity is as trendy as some of the responses have been. Yeah. And so, um, I do believe that because the conversation has started, it's going to continue, mm-hmm. but I, I believe that we're a long way from seeing the changes that we really need to to see because diversity has been achieved so easily because diversity is pretty much easy to achieve. You just take Mm -hmm. a magazine, we're going to put a black model on the cover. We achieved diversity. We can say, Mm. you know, here we had out of the 12 months of 12 issues of the year, we had eight black models on the cover or eight Asian models or eight Latinx models or, you know, or eight Indian models, however we want to do it. We can, we can diversify those numbers and, and, and we've achieved diversity front facing. Hmm. But when it comes to inclusion and equity, if we look at the teams that you put together, well, you had yeah. a black, but the whole team was white or, you know, all of your editorial staff is white. You, your masthead, well, how many black people do you have on your masthead? How many black people are, are, are people of color are in your C-suite? You know, those kinds of yeah. things. We're not really looking deeper, you know, even when it comes to vendors and supply chain, you know, are you, you know, for your awards, are you, 
or for your gala or your event? Do you have a black floor? So who's doing the catering or, you know, I mean, all of those things, all of those things matter, um, you know, to achieve diversity holistically. And I, yeah. I just think we have a long way to go. We have a deeper look um, to, to make. And I think that um, when you look at, there's a quote that's very popular by um, Verna, Verna Myers that says, uh, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Yep. Yep. Uh, that we have to take that a step further. And now equity means that in order for me to dance, I have to be able to change the music and you have to be okay with that. I love it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I, all of that, because you think about some of the appointments and, you know, they're like, Oh, let's bring this black person in. Let, let's bring this person of color in. But it's like, does the environment support that person? Mm -hmm. Are their ideas being respected? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there an opportunity it's, 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 to move up? Yeah. And those are things that matter. I think that, you know, as a person who has had a seat at the table and I've been mm -hmm. in these rooms, the experience, I know people often celebrate these positions, but if you ask the people who are in these positions about their experience, they would have a conversation that I'm not sure if you're really <laughs> ready for, you know, yeah. and while I'm grateful, but there's a bigger there's a bigger movement and work that has to happen in that area as well. And so, you know, even those who are in those positions that people are watching and they're saying, oh, well, they should be doing this and, and they should be doing that. And why aren't they doing this? And, you know, I know there's a lot of critique because and there's a lot of pressure in being in those positions. But I often say to people, just give them some grace because mm -hmm. it's not as easy. You know, it's not, although the position was celebrated, um, yeah. sometimes being in that position in those rooms and at those tables is not as celebrated as the announcement. And so Absolutely. you Give them some grace and just understand that they are there and they're not just taking up space, but the work and the responsibility they have, it yeah. is a weight that that not many people can carry. And so yeah. I you just have to give them some grace. Yeah. I love that. So, you know, lightening up the mood a bit. I see that you rock a lot of black designers on, mm -hmm. on your Instagram. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like, do you have a few who are at the top of your list or, you know, some that are your go-tos? I don't want you to pick favorites. Ooh, that's really tough. And there's um, so many. <laughs> yeah, that's really tough. Oh my God. Um, well, I'll tell you some I admire. Instead of picking favorites, I'll yes, just... Let's do it. Yeah, let's do Yeah. There, there are these two cousins, um, they have, and they're jewelry designers, they have a brand called Create Freedom. Um, their Instagram is Create Freedom NYC. Their names are Mac and um, Javon. And uh, I just met them actually just this past weekend. I invited them to brunch here at my home, but they um, are amazing. They're, they're, I mean, their minds are just incredible, but I love what they're doing. And they really have only had their collection for just over a year, but they are oh, part wow. of um, the one for the future mentorship program I have with NYC Jewelry Week. And they reached out to me. I did not know these guys. They sent me an email and said, we saw the work that you're doing. We'd love to be involved. We just started our brain. We'd love for you to check it out and give us any direction. And I really admire what they're doing in their minds. And they're young. They're new on the block. Not a lot of people even know about them, but they're just they're just two that I admire for taking the reins of a dream that they have and pushing it forward, even in the midst of a pandemic. And those wow. things just, you know, you just can't ignore. And so um, there are people I, li I like to shout out, you know, from time to time. Also, you mentioned uh, Rico Chappelle. Yes, Rico. Mm -hmm. I love Rico. Uh, I think that Rico often for me, he doesn't get he doesn't get the shine that he should consider. Yeah considering the impact that he's made on the in industry and the longevity, the fact that Rico is his, he's been here and he's mm -hmm. still here. And, you know, he's not one that, that many people know about now for some reason, um, but he still is here. And I'd like for people to know who he is and for yeah. people to, to not just know, but also to buy, to shop, to, to talk to him. He's just a great individual. Um, so I actually, yeah, I love rocking. Yeah. My so it's like, Hey, but yeah, Rico. Um, oh my gosh. When it comes to jewelry designers in New York, there's, so so many um you know but i admire theophilo uh, yes. uh you no know, fashion designers theophilo of course we have pierre moss we have you know april walker who i admire who's you know reviving uh walker wear uh in in a big way Crazy. and i saw her placement at the she's so was with her. yeah yeah and she's incredible to even talk to absolutely so you know those those are people who i'm just looking at and really just admiring you know what what they're doing also there are these two brothers um from um atlanta they have a company called uh, a brand called wear brims it's a, a hat brand um called wear brims and they're the first black owned menswear hat brand to be in nordstrom 
and they wow. just wow yes yes but you have to check them out amazing guys and i met them on clubhouse wow that's amazing that is amazing. Well, you know, we're coming to the end, Elliot. We're coming to the end. I, I mean, I could literally talk to you all day. Like, this could be a two-hour conversation. Let's make sure we keep in touch and talk more. Yes. Don't yes. be a stranger. I'll I'll grab some time on your calendar. Okay. Okay. Um, but I have to ask, I ask all of our guests, mm-hmm. what is one of your favorite fashion moments of all time it could be something personal professional something you witnessed but just a really magical moment for you oh magical yeah just where you're just like oh my god just one just one it doesn't have to be the top top but one of your top favorite I, I, you know what I'm doing? I know I know the first thing that came to mind. I don't mm-hmm. want to do it because I think it's mentioned all the time, but it truly is. Don't one, worry but, about Go ahead. Yeah. There's no, this I is a safe space. Yeah, yeah. I keep trying to think of something secondary, but I'm going to be authentic. Um, the Pierre Ma show. Uh, <gasps> show at that is not, no. <laughs> at I, I think it was, I think Bevy, Bevy talked about that. Mm-hmm. I think it was either... Was it Bevy or Misa? It may have been Misa, Misa okay. Hilton. Okay. But someone else had mentioned that one okay. as well. Yeah. And for me, I'll tell you why it was it was so magical for me personally, because it literally was me sitting in the midst of my all my worlds coming together. It wow. was my music world and my fashion world were together in one place. And it just, I mean, Literally, I was like, "Oh, I could, I could have been in the choir. I could have directed." Uh-huh, the yeah, I, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, those were. It was like, "Oh, this is me." It, it just, it just uh, really, it was emotional. I mean, I cried. I, cr- um, I cried watching it on my oh, on my computer. I, I knew every song. I mean, me even the, all the old school music because that I grew up in the blues and and yeah. and, 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 R&B and oh my gosh, it just it was everything. It just uh, it was everything, and I. I loved it. Even just being at the theater, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's back to my performance days. And I was on stages like this. And I mean, it just, it was, it was literally like a culmination of all my life experience. Uh, and so it was, I really, really loved that. It just, it really resonated with me. And everyone was there. Like everyone. everyone. Yeah. I got to see my girl Fantasia. <laughs> yeah. She was there. Yeah. She was there. Her and her husband. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> we love Fantasia. We, we love to see you. We love her. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elliot. You are, it, it is, it has truly been an honor chatting with you. Oh, I it, just it, feel so inspired. It, Everybody go get that book, you know, and oh, where can they find you? you? Where they can, where, where can they learn more about you? Oh, I'm Elliot Carlisle on everything uh, social media wise. And of course my website is elliotcarlisle.net, not .com. All right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate you so much. I appreciate you anytime. Thanks so much for joining me for this week of A Fashion Moment. If you like what you hear, we'd love for you to join our community of listeners and spread the word about the show. We also want to hear from you. Share your favorite fashion moments and dream guests with us by sending an audio clip or email to a fashion moment podcast at gmail.com. Or you can tag us on Instagram at a fashion moment and you could be featured on next week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review and let us know what you think. Until then, see you next time for another fashion moment. Podcast production by Rebecca Rashid and John Taylor Williams. Digital media production by Megan Porras. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Patrick Patrickios for their song, Hot Coffee.